Oh, you sound just like really chill, man. Wow. This is I well I <laughs> I should probably tell you right off the bat, I'm not like crazy or anything. I just make weird cartoons. Like I'm I'm not insane or mean or anything, so I mean I'm just kinda gonna be chill and answer whatever you wanna ask, man. Yeah, I I guess, you know, a lot of people have the wrong first impressions, like people do think you're crazy for your weird cartoons. I'm very aware, believe me. Hello everyone, I'm Mike Mixtape, and welcome to something new I'm starting called The Real Real Rundown, where I get the real rundown from upcoming indie filmmakers plus more in the industry of film. First up, obviously, for this interview, I'm interviewing a man who has gathered a cult following through his shorts and films. He's got the style and he's going to prove it with films such as Where the Dead Go to Die and his most recent film coming out soon, When Black Birds Fly. You might also know him as Lappy in Where the De Dead Go to Die. It's Jimmy Screamer Claus. Welcome, Jimmy. Good evening, sir. How's it going, man? Not too bad, not too bad. Today was Mother's Day. Went and visited the parents. Home oh. now. That's good, good. Mother's Day indeed. Mm-hmm. So, uh, does your mother know what you're doing for a living? <laughs> it's funny because they had the uh, they had the neighbor over, and he's he's kind of crazy. <laughs> They're like, you should watch Jimmy's cartoons. So they put my, <laughs> so they put my trailer on for a uh, for my new movie on the iPad, and he's like, wow, this is really cool. This is what? Whoa! What? <laughs> so it's pretty funny to watch his reaction. Um, she, she, I mean, she knows I make like really fucked up movies and stuff, but she hasn't watched them. And she doesn't want to, and it's probably for the better because, like, I've so shown her episodes of South Park that still to this day give her nightmares. So, like, she would not in a million years be able to handle anything like this. Oh, I bet. <laughs> like, there's that one South Park episode. It's um, it's a Thanksgiving special. It's the one where they have like the fucked up turkey and it's dragging its head behind it. Mm -hmm. For I've... some reason, that just got to some weird part of her brain where to this day, sometimes she'll text me in the middle of the night. She's like, "Don't you think about that?" <laughs> oh man, okay. I was just wondering about that because. But yeah, I mean, she's she's very supportive of it. You know, she's. I mean, when I was making Where the Dead Go to Die, I was kind of, uh, like I was kind of in between, like I was in a weird life place. You know, I was moving mm -hmm. around a lot and kind of like that. So she was worried on that aspect. But then once the movie actually got, like, commercially released and stuff like that, she started to see, like, oh, maybe you can actually do this. So she started to, you know, help me out a little more. Oh, that's cool. Very supportive indeed. Yep. Real good. Okay, so... Thanks. Just thanks for coming on, man. It's just... It's pretty cool meeting in and all that stuff. Not a problem. Thank you for having me. So, before we get into the juicy bits about your filmography, let's just start off with the beginning, of course. So... First off, just a simple question: What's the inspiration behind behind your screen name of uh, Jimmy Screamer Claus? Uh, well, I let's see. From I used to do like a, I still kind of do, but I used to do techno music, like hardcore, uh, speedcore, kind of weird industrial techno music. Okay. That's my DJ name. It was just Screamer Claus, and my real first name is Jimmy. So mm -hmm. you know, when I met other DJs and stuff, typically in the DJ scene, people would have their real first names, and then you know, their stage name is their last name like that's just how like people talk to each other in that scene oh so that's how people knew me was jimmy screamer claws oh. and um, like i kind of always wanted to make movies but i didn't really have the confidence when i was younger like in my early 20s and stuff mm -hmm. so i focused more on music it was right at that point when you know all the uh the programs were first stomach start coming out like fl studio and reason and everything right so like, I, I realized i could do that on my own so I focused more on music for like the first eight years or whatever, my 20s or five years or whatever. And then, uh, so that's what I did then. And when I moved over to movies, I just figured I'd just keep that name because that's kind of what people sort of knew me as. But now I'm getting older and people are still calling me Screamer Claus. It's like, hey, call me Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy indeed. I was just curious about that. I was just like, Screamer Claus, that's just so weird. But yeah, it, was just some, it was just some stupid shit I made up when I was a kid. And then when I got on the internet, you know, you need a screen name, so uh -huh. that, and then, you know, that bridged into DJ, blah, blah, blah. 
sure you know the whole story. You grew up with the internet. Oh yeah, everybody does that at one point, so it's understandable. Um, so what inspired you to become a filmmaker in the first place? Um, well, growing up, I just I really loved horror movies, like especially low budget, weird, fucked up horror movies. And I also really liked um, like really weird animation. So like in, when I grew up, it was I grew up more in the the nineties. Oh okay. And, uh, at that point. Like MTV, like had all the craziest, weirdest, mm. best animation ever. So I grew up watching that when I was a teenager, and I loved it. Like I loved that, and I loved horror movies. So I just I wanted to find some way to combine them eventually. <laughs> okay. And that's just kind of I kind of went that direction, but yeah. That's cool. I used to. I grew up in the nineties too, so I know what you're talking about. Okay, so we're semi around the same age. Yeah, just about more or less. Um. So you're basically a one-man filmmaker, like you do everything when it comes to making a film or short, like directing, acting, composing music and all that stuff? Mm-hmm. Okay, because there's not a lot of what, usually when it comes to filmmakers, out there, they have like a team that helps them out, and you're just out there just doing it all by yourself. Yeah, well, I mean, it's kind of, I tried to, before I made Where the Dead Go to Die, I tried to make like two live action features. Yeah. And it was just really, really difficult. And like the most difficult part about it was just trying to get everybody to show up in the same place at the same time. You know? Okay. So it's like, then when I started learning more about like After Effects and 3D programs and stuff, I, I realized, you know, if I could just, if I can get people for a day to record a voice or to do whatever, and then, you know, I could just spend the next X amount of time, you know, animating the film. And I just, I started out with shorts. And I just, like, Where the Dead Go to Die wasn't really supposed to be a feature. Mm -mm. It just kind of accidentally ended up that way. But I guess I'll tell that story later. Yeah, you will. We'll, we'll get to that to that point. Um, did that answer your question? Because I kind of forget what it is now. <laughs> what it originally was. Um, actually, actually, a couple of questions you asked already. So uh, I, that's, okay, I was, I was wondering why animation instead of live action. Like, that does make sense because you got to get everybody all... In one place so at one time, it's just if with animation, it's all voiceover, it's simple, clean, and all that stuff. Yeah, and it's like when you don't, when you're doing it all yourself, and you know, you're coming up with your own money. Like I remember my first film, the way I financed it was I sold my entire DVD collection that I collected as a teenager. Mm. And so you know that gave me I don't know what it was at the time, five grand or something like that. So it's like, okay, how do I take this five grand and make the thing on the paper happen? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So it's like, and it's really, really hard. It's oh, really yeah. hard to do it. Totally understandable. Um, do you have any prior education in the field of film? None, none whatsoever. Wow. Just, uh, I mean, I, like, when that, you know, DVDs first started coming out, and you know, I had access to behind the scenes and commentaries and uh -huh. stuff like that. Like that sort of stuff kind of became my film school because, you know, I grew up idolizing all these directors and everything, and loving those movies and everything, and then you get. You get to like listen to the commentary and hear what the director had to say about it and how they shot it. So I had that sort of experience, and I read some filmmaking books, and then just you know fooling around with my friends, and you just you know every movie gets a little better, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? You get you gain more experience as you yeah, go like, on. You're learning as you go. Yeah, you you learn from your fuck up on the movie before. <laughs> exactly. Um. Da, da, da. So you just basically, when you animated, you just learned the program as you went on, just like experimenting with it. Yeah, like I, when I made um, the first short, Tain and Milk, it was mm -hmm. 2008, I believe, and uh, like I had no, none, like no animation training whatsoever. I just had this little weird script. I had some of my friends from the indie scene do a couple weird voices. I didn't know it was gonna be like scary and weird. I kind of thought it was just gonna be this silly, stupid thing. Right. So. I just had my friends do weird voices, and I literally just took the pages and just from, you know, <laughs> shot one, just opened the program, how do I do this shot? So I would figure that shot out, then I'd go to the next shot, all right, how do I do this shot? And just kind of progress from there until I had the whole movie. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. Uh, it's, it must be hard to figure that shit out, because I'm not good with programs, so I can never figure shit out unless I read stuff. The hardest part was at the time I um, the only computer I had was a Core 2 Quad. Mm. I don't know for people who aren't too computery, those were the first line of quad core computers, which every computer is pretty much quad core now. 
So right. those were the first ones. I only had one, and it only had like four gig of RAM. Oh. So I, I couldn't even do like whole scenes. I would have to anim I'd have to render the backgrounds, render each character, and then assemble <laughs> all of it after. Like, so it was, it was a nightmare. That's how I did the first two shorts. Oh. And then when I got to the third one, I started buying more computers, so I could you know animate a shot and then send it to another computer to render, like a little render farm. Oh. So I have now, you know, it's a few years later, and I've made a little bit of money, so I bought some more computers, so I have all i7s now, four of them, and that's my little render farm, my huh. home render farm. Huh, that's clever. It's actually pretty clever there. So uh, what's your favorite thing about being an independent filmmaker? Uh, <laughs> I guess the fact that um, there's really no one telling me what I can and can't do. Mm-hmm. You know, well, until I put it out, <laughs> right? <laughs> <I> review it. <laughs> but I mean, I like I like the freedom of it. I don't like that I'm kind of broke all the time, which right. is a big problem. But I mean, I guess there's that. There's the freedom of it, and then you know, when you're at a lower level, you still can, you know, you can still communicate directly with fans. Like I don't get over rushed with messages, you know, so I can still answer everybody without any problems, really. Like it's not overwhelming or anything, you know. Yeah, you're. You got like a call following going with your fandom, and it's just, it's not too big, but it's just like in between. And, you know, a lot of people think I'm actually crazy, so now a lot of people actually contact me. Yeah, they're, they're like afraid to talk to you or something, so. Yeah, or they think I'll, you know, I'm fucked up and I'll say something mean, which I won't, I promise. <laughs> I mean, he's a really nice guy, so if you want to chat with him, just chat with him. Um, lastly, for this section, I just wanted to ask is uh what are some goals you want to achieve as an independent filmmaker uh, well right now i'm trying i'm with i finished a good cut of my my second film when blackbirds fly so i'm trying to get it into um film festivals because mm -hmm. i've never like i'm where the dead go to die I played a couple little ones and citrus was the biggest one in spain that it played so i never really got to do that i've never ha got to have the festival experience Oh. So I'm kind of hoping to do that. I'd like to do that, even if it doesn't go well, you know, because festivals are tricky. You never know what, even if you get in, you never know if the people that go are going to like it or be into what you're doing. Yep. Or, or if, you know, your movie's going to end up being the one that shows at 8 o'clock on Sunday that nobody goes to, you know. <laughs> right. So it's, always, it's like everything's a gamble, so you just got to do what you can. Do what you, do what you got to do. But, I mean, that's, that's my goal now is I want to have... I want to try to have the festival experience. I'm not even positive if I'm, if I'm trying to sell the film to a company. I just want to try the festival circuit and kind of see what happens. All right, all right. Yeah, it's a, I, I've never been to a film festival, so it's just it's, it's something I actually want to do someday just to check films out and all that shit. I've been to a couple, but they've mostly been smaller ones. Hmm. Still fun, but... So... You started out with the shorts, but eventually, in due time, you led up to what is now what we call the cult film known as Where the Dead Go to Die. So, for those who haven't seen it, what is Where the Dead Go to Die, in a nutshell? Uh, well, Where the Dead Go to Die is a combination of three shorts that I did over a three-year period. Kind of the way it came to be was I made that Tainted Milk short mm -hmm. in 2008, started showing it around in 2009. I think that's around when I put it on YouTube, too, because I probably had it for about six months before I put it on YouTube. All right. I would just show my friends and everything. And then, um, like, I was still touring at the time. Like, I had a European tour gig at the time for my DJ thing. So I was making Liquid Memories, like, in between doing that music stuff. And then I believe I finished Liquid Memories in like summer 2010 and then in October 2010 I somehow attracted the uh, attention of Unearth Films who's an underground um, horror movie label mm. that specializes in mostly like extreme films like they released all the guinea pig films and uh, uh, the vomit gore trilogy and all that crazy shit so um, he got a hold of the two shorts Steven Byro is his name he's the head of Unearth Films and uh, he called me on the phone because my number was on the DVD and he said, you know, I love these two shorts, but they only equal something like 45 minutes put together. Can you come up with another 45 minutes? And I said, sure. He's like, can you make it more fucked up than the first two? Oh, jeez. I said, sure. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so, I mean, I think it took about a year to do that 45-minute chunk. And then I turned it in in something like summer 2011. And then, you know, it takes months of 
going through distribution companies and shit and came out sometime in 2012, February, I think. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, for the first couple years, it was, it was pretty quiet. Like, uh, there was reviews coming out, but they were mostly from horror movie people. Right. And I kind of, like, I kind of figured it was over, you know? Until about six months ago, <laughs> when all these new reviews started popping up. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was, you kind of answered a couple of these questions of mine. Um, oh, sorry, I probably shouldn't have ranted. <laughs> It's all right. It's actually it's kind of quicker that way. Um, but is there like any hit, hidden messages within it, or is it just just a fucked up movie? I mean, Tainted Milk was literally I just thought it was going to be something funny and stupid. Like even the kid fucking a dog thing, which is you know I've heard <laughs> more times in my life at this point. I I just thought it was so stupid and dumb. Like I did not think in a million years anyone would take it seriously. First of all. <laughs> Like, first of all, I didn't really think anyone would ever see it. I just thought I would kind of be on YouTube, and, you know, some people would say, oh, that's funny. <laughs> and I certainly never thought anyone would be offended by it. Yeah, we'll get into I mean, that. And then Liquid Memories, at the sec in the third chapter, I tried to take more seriously. Like, there's the rumor going around that I made the film as a comedy, the whole film, and it's, like, it's really not true except for Tainted Milk. Like, Tainted okay. Milk, I did really think was going to be funny, and I still kind of think it's funny. <laughs> Cause I, I heard that rumor, too. It's like, cause some, and one of my friends was telling me, it's like, it was intended as a comedy. I was thinking, like, what? Who thinks yeah. this is funny? <laughs> well, the way it happened was, like, I just told that kind of the same story I just told you. I told on the commentary, mm -hmm. and when it got reviewed by Diamanda Hagen. I think oh, that's, yeah, her that, that's her name, yep. Yep, she, uh, she pronounced, I mean, she, uh, that's what she said. She said he, you know, he intended this whole film as a comedy, and then it kind of just, Went from you know, there. that was the biggest review at the time that had the most hits, so, it, you know, because yeah. of that, that's, you know, they sent the movie to Mr. Enter, and your friend, and blah, 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 you know, it just, it branched off from that. Yeah, okay, that's where so it, it came all, from like, then. All the kind of weird rumors and half-truths kind of come from that Diamanda <laughs> review, and I really like her, like, I've contacted her. And we've talked. Like, I don't have any problem with her whatsoever, and I think her review's really funny. But that kind of does suck. Oh, <laughs> man. I, gotta, I, was... cause I get, like, comments all day long, like, how can you make this a comedy, you sick motherfucker? <laughs> <laughs> and, like, yeah. I try, you know, it's like I try to, like, type back, and then they're like, how dare you even answer me, you fuck? <laughs> Who the yeah. fuck do you think you are answering me? God, it's just hilarious. How dare you defend yourself, you piece of shit? Just people just are outrageous. And I always try to be polite. I'm always like, no, you know, I, that's not what happened, blah, blah, blah. Here's the real story. And they're like, you're an arrogant piece of shit. And, and I just die. You should go to jail and die. <laughs> I know. I, it's like, I, Jesus I, fucking Christ, I just made a cartoon. Yeah, just calm down, people. I mean, <laughs> that's why I want to do this interview, because people have the wrong impression with you, and it's, just, it's like I want to clear the air with this information, just like people understand you more and maybe appreciate your work better. Well, that's why I said that to Diamanda. I was like, put me on your podcast. I'll explain it all. She's like, no, my wife is afraid of you. And I was like, come on. <laughs> really? <laughs> come on. <laughs> like, fucking come on. <laughs> She's like, no, your movie really, really upset her, and she's terrified of you. I'm like, I'm not. <laughs> so what am I gonna do? First of all, like, even if I was crazy, what am I? What could I possibly do? Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, it's hilarious. Yeah, a lot of people are just scared of you. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> so, well, because nobody ever bothers to actually, you know, contact me or anything. They just they watch just assume. My... I was like, yeah, I know the movie's fucked up, but it's a horror movie. Like, what do you, what do you want? You want it to not be fucked up? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so th there's another kind of, I don't know if it's a rumor or not, but I heard this as well. It's like, but were you high on drugs while you were making the? I smoke weed every day of my life, so yes, but I don't do other drugs. <laughs> oh, okay, so it's just marijuana. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't even drink. I don't smoke cigarettes. I've never been drunk in my entire life. I've never done coke, heroin, speed. I've done mushrooms. I've taken my body weight in mushrooms and had my third eye squeegeed, as Bill Hicks would say. But I don't really even do that anymore. I do smoke weed every day, but it's just weed. Okay. So, I mean, if that means I'm on drugs, then yes, I'm on drugs. So, like, so yeah, there you go, people. He was on marijuana when he made the film. And I've said that, <laughs> like, a lot. So... But if, like, I guess marijuana is drugs. I, I get. I, oh, well, I like drugs. It, it's labeled like that. I mean, 
And what else do you call it? I mean, it's a porn. I mean, it's going to be legal in the next decade or so. It should be. I mean, it's almost legal at this point. Like, you re even if you get caught with it, it's really not even a thing anymore. Yeah. Like, give me your weed. Pay me $300. Get the fuck out of my face. Yeah. Um, so, with, is your mind twisted with, with this, like, all the gruesome and graphic images that's in the film? It's just like... I was watching, I was just like, well, where did you come up with this shit? I mean, I really don't know. It's just, I did. I just did it. Like, I literally just wrote scripts, and I just figured it out. <laughs> oh, God. Like, I just, like, I, I, I know, like, there's supposed to be some big cosmic reason, but there <laughs> really isn't. I just did it. You just, you just did it. I don't know where. Out of the like, blue. Like, I never, like, you gotta understand, like, I never in a million years thought anyone would take all this so seriously. Like, cause I know they're not animated well. Like, <laughs> oh yeah, well, that. yeah, exactly. So animation's like, not that great. Cause like on one hand, like people are like, "This is the most stupid animation ever," and on the other hand, they're like, "This is the most fucked up, disturbing thing ever." It's like, well, <laughs> which one is it? Yeah, <laughs> is it animated badly or is it disturbing? Is it both? It could be both. I mean, I I, I I understood the whole animation thing. I was like, okay, okay, he had limitations with the animation, sure. But it's just like I was watching it with my friends, and I was just like, "Whoa!" It's just like, "Damn!" The, the the images, and I was I was like raped in my mind with it. I was just, I mean, at first I was shocked. I was speechless. But as time went on, I got, I grew to appreciate, you know, what you did with it. Like uh, compared to other people who would just went batshit crazy and just like, "Whoa, whoa! Don't watch this! It was so bad!" It's just like. Calm the fuck down. It's just a movie. Well, so, because of that Mr. Enter review, like, I'm not even positive who that dude is. I don't know like, either. I now don't. I get hate mail from 14-year-olds every 10 minutes or so. <laughs> oh, God. I don't even know Mr. Enter. I People talk about him once in a while. I don't know him that much. Like, I have no clue who he is, but somehow his, mo his video about my movie has almost as much hits as the trailer that I released oh. three years ago. Oh, or, shit. Or okay. So it's like, fuck you, man. Oh, God Come damn on. it. Yeah, damn it. So, uh, the film where the dead go to die, it's an anthology film, basically? Yeah, well, the thing is, when I, re when I sold it to the distributor, right. for some reason they're like, you're not allowed to call it an anthology film. What? And I was like, that, there's distribution's a whole different fucking universe that I don't even know how to go into. <laughs> like, it's so fucking weird how everything works. But that was one of the notes I got right away. That's why there's just that weird, vague plot description, because like, they're like, you can't mention this, you can't call it an anthology. There was like five things I couldn't do. I can't remember what any of the other ones are now. But like, one of them was I was not allowed anywhere to call it an anthology. All the reviewers were not allowed to call it an anthology if they wanted screeners. Like, they're like, it's a dirty word, it's tainted, nobody watches anthology movies. Oh, come on, that's a, a great little niche genre. I mean, it's basically your shorts of tainted and milk, liquid memories, and the mask that the monster wears. Yes. And so it, but do they, how do you, do these stories actually tie in with each other in the film or how does that work? If you watch closely, they do. What it's supposed to be is that Tainted Milk and the third short, The Mask the Monsters Wear, take place at the same time. Okay. And then Liquid Memories takes place 20 or 30 years in the future when they're adults. So the man in Liquid Memories is supposed to be Tommy. And then the hooker is supposed to be the little girl from the third short. So, so it's so it's supposed to be that, and if you look closely as well, the the um, you know, the soldier that she goes into the alley with, right, is the guy in the third short who Ralph kills when he kills the father as well. So like, it's supposed to be that Tommy spent like the rest of his life basically trying to erase the memory of what when he killed his parents and all that stuff. He like to the point where he even forgot who the little girl was who you see him interacting with. In the third short, you know what huh. I'm saying. So okay. like, there's that okay. connection. Okay. Okay. So it's like it's, I know it's it's not really explained. <laughs> no, 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 it's not. It's not. I'm just... It's not explained like really at all. No, no, I, I can't even. <laughs> I couldn't even follow it when I was watching. I was just like, that, what the fuck is I going mean, on? <laughs> and I think if you would have known if it was an anthology film, and maybe if I put Liquid Memories at the end, but yeah. I put them in the order I made instead. Yeah, if it made more sense if you just put them in the order like they should have been instead yeah. of by release date. I mean, that would have made so much sense. Mm -hmm. <sighs> so it's kind of a disjointed story. Like I was kind of going for like a kind of like a Sin City kind of pulp fiction kind of structure. 
Yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah, like but a it's like, you non-linear. Know, stuff takes place yeah. at the same time, sometimes in the future, then you go back, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Kind of like a, a non-linear way to, like a cut-up story. That I can understand more than, yeah. But at the same time, it really wasn't supposed to be an anthology film. I nope. was just making shorts, but I had an offer to release it, so I was like, all right. Yeah, might <laughs> as well. I'm not going to say no. <laughs> You know, I mean, you can buy the film at Walmart now. <laughs> How really? I, I really? If you go on Walmart.com, you can order Where the Dead Go to Die. You can I... order it from Target.com. You can order it from every major retailer you can picture. Oh, my God. You get local <laughs> distribution. Yep. I sold it to a major distribution company. That's why when people on the internet are like, you're a fucking failure. I'm like, really? No, you go to your <laughs> store. Buy my movie in Walmart. Yeah, you can buy I made it, bro. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, kind of, damn, and now I gotta look for that in my local store and see if I can buy I don't it. Know, I don't know that they carry it in store, because it's old now. Like, maybe the first year they did. Like, I used to find it in retail shops the first year. Oh, Typically, so maybe... unless your movie's like a huge breakout success, after the first year, they don't really order anymore. Right, so it might be... nobody, the, the second thing is nobody really buys anything anymore, so, you know, as you, I'm sure you've noticed, Best Buy's DVDs have basically gone away. You know, oh, they're all yeah. just mainstream movies now. Right. So, like, there's no, like, independents really aren't in retail. Right, yeah, all. that makes like, sense. Like, they'll give them that year just to see what happens. But after that year, like, that's it. Uh, like, that's kind of the way the movie industry works. After a year, nobody nobody gives a shit anymore. No, they just forget it. Yep, unless it's some huge breakout. Yep, some huge, huge thing. Um, kind of touched upon the voice acting a bit, but uh, who do you normally cast? Is it local people, you know, any... Do, have you met anybody famous with voice acting, or do you, do you voice it sometimes yourself? Uh, famous. The most famous person I probably had as a voice so far is David Firth, who does the Salad Fingers cartoons. Oh, okay. And he plays a he plays a major character in my new film. Uh, oh. And where did they go to die? He's not super famous, but Trent Haygod's a big person in the horror movie world, who I got uh, I got cast in the third short. Okay. But uh, pretty much everyone else is just um, friends I met in the independent community, like Brandon Slagle, Ruby LaRocca, Victor Bonacore, you know, just people I know, other filmmakers from from the scene. Okay. And, you know, I met M. Dot Strange, who became a good friend of mine, too, so he worked a lot on my new film. He helped me do sound. So it's like you, you meet people as you go along and grow. That's good. That's cool. So it's like, where, even though Where the Dead Go Die is not, like, the greatest movie in the world, it mm -hmm. opened a lot of doors for me. Exactly, yeah. Like it really, like, I, it really opened a lot of doors and it really got me a lot of things. Mm-hmm. That's, that's kind of a good thing with, with your first film and stuff. You know, you meet new people, you know, and then you advance on to bigger and better stuff beyond that. Yep. Um, actually, I did want to mention a character in Where the Dead Go to Die. It's Lappy. Mm -hmm. Where did that... Now, that character was... Is that character in all three shorts? He's in all three shorts, yes. Because oh, it's funny because my friend Matt, he's just he's so terrified of Lappy. It's so <laughs> weird. And then you voiced the character, which is I did. I, I just I didn't know that. I was like, who is this guy voicing Lappy? I was just like, holy fuck crap, thing he is. <laughs> I was like, holy <laughs> fuck, it's the director and the writer of the film. <laughs> Blew my uh, mind. Well, I mean. The way the Labby came about was I made when it, Teen and Milk was supposed to be a parody of Lassie, so oh. that's why you know, Lassie, Labby, Tommy, Timmy, and you know Lassie typically you know there's somebody trapped in the well, so you know that's where all those references came from. Oh, okay. But then as I rewrote it and rewrote it, you know the Lassie references got less and less and less, and it just became its own kind of nightmare thing. Yeah. Okay. So um, the way I did Teen and Milk was I had. I went to Ruby LaRocca's house, and Victor Bonacore was living there at the time. Joey Smack was living there at the time. And uh, I just had them do voices, and the only voice that was left over was uh, the voice of Labby. So I was like, I'll just do that one, you know, just so I didn't have to find another person. Like, I literally just went to her house, and whoever lived there was like, you're going to play this character. You're going to play this character. You're gonna play Here's your script. We're going to set up a nice little area in the basement. <laughs> and I just we just did it in her basement. Oh, that's interesting. And then, uh, yeah, I, just, I made the short over, like, I don't even remember how long it took, because I wasn't, I just did it in my spare time. Right. It took a few months, though. Okay. Uh, so, of course, the last part of this I just wanted to mention, it's all about the reviews that are coming out of the film. So, um, recently, my friend Matt, 
Brunei, also known as Animat, he did a review of the film Where the Dead Go to Die, and there's been huge reception over it. And a lot of other reviews out there, they're mostly negative. Some are mixed, some are, like, positive. So what do you think about all the feedback you're getting on the film now? I mean, well, it seems to come from two different camps. There's the horror movie world that doesn't always like it, but usually gives it decent reviews. Like, you know, I've gotten a lot of three- and four-star reviews from that community. Mm -hmm. But then there's the, like... I don't want to say the whole animation community, but this this like section of the animation community that mainly reviews, I guess, children's animation. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm way off base there, but I've seemed to have pissed all of them off. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, a lot of those bad reviews are all coming from that side of the world, or yeah. that you know section of film fans. So yeah. it's like when Mister Enter did his review, there's about. 15 people who want to be Mr. Enter. Oh, so God. they reviewed the movie because Mr. Enter did. Oh, jeez. And if you watch, like, if you watch some of them, like, they say, like, I haven't watched the movie. I don't need to watch the movie. Mr. Enter says it's bad. What? <laughs> so, and so, you know, it's like, the world is really weird now. It it's is. It's like, as, like, people, like, I grew up idolizing, like, you know, directors and musicians and stuff like that. But now, because of like people like the nostalgia critic and angry video game nerd and cinema snob and all them, yep. there's this new crop of kids who grow up looking up to them. Yeah. And there's not really anything wrong with that. No. Nope. But the thing is, like, the nostalgia critic, he's an entertainer. You know what I mean? Right. He's not a reviewer. Like his reviews are mainly for entertainment purposes. Yeah. But a lot of these kids seem to not. You know, they try to blur the line. Like, they try to make it kind of like a real review, but then, you know, they class it up for the entertainment purposes. And right, it's just, yep. It's kind of, like, it's good and it's bad. Like, I, I think the Diamanda Hagen review is really funny, but at the same time, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really help me. <laughs> no, 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 yeah. It's great that she's doing it, she's doing her thing, but, you know. Mm-hmm. It doesn't necessarily help my film. It gets it out to new people, but if those if those group of kids are just people who want to tear apart movies for views on the internet, then it's like yeah, you know, one, one of them will do it, and then ten people will copy it. Probably yeah. I, I, I'm in that community myself. It's the reviewer community, and people idolize you know the nostalgia critic and all those people you know. And I, I mean, I love their videos too. I watch Angry Video Game. They're every you know every chance I get. I love that. Oh yeah, I mean. But you know, I recognize that it's it's entertainment. It's it not is. Reviews. It is. But now, like, it kind of fucked it up a little bit. It kind of fucked the lineup. <laughs> yeah, it did. Because yeah, when he came, when the massage creator came by, he just screwed everything up. I mean, no offense to him, but. I mean, because now he releases those videos that are like, here are my real thoughts on the film. <laughs> yes, those. Yeah, he just did those recently, so that's that's the good thing, but. <laughs> But it's a little too late because now he's been like, you know, trying to do the his. World's like, changed now. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, people are trying to do comedy, you know, trying to riff on movies and all that stuff, and. And it's like I don't mind that so much, but at the same time, it's like, a lot of these guys have followers, a lot of followers mm -hmm. that you know, give them Patreon money and whatever. Yeah. But I know a lot of filmmakers that are struggling because people refuse to buy DVDs. But people will pay people to watch their funny reviews of DVDs. Yeah, so yeah, it's like, exactly. It kind of it kind of fucks me and my friends over too. <laughs> exactly, you know? and it just it's not it's kind of not it's like fair. People are pulling all their dollars into reviewers on YouTube instead of the people making the films. Yeah, and like that's... I work for distributors freelance. Like that's how I make money. I do mm -hmm. DVD menus. I animate you know little bumpers and stuff, oh. and they are fucking terrified. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> in the distribution world is fucking terrified <laughs> at all levels because you know shit shit like BitTorrent, Redbox and Netflix the combination of that has completely eviscerated the video community oh yeah the that's retail right. community and all that like 10 years ago you could release a DVD you know get it into every video store in the country right there yep. a few hundred thousand units yep. now if you can sell 2,000 copies of DVDs people are like how do you do how the fuck did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, it's a whole new world now. It's like, just it's... they are all they're all like they're all shitting their pants because every year their numbers are going down and down and down, and then VOD's popping up, 
Yes, you know, that, that too. I was helping, but now that's going. That's shrinking too. Now yeah. people are just like, if it's not on Netflix, I don't give a fuck. And oh, it's nearly impossible to get your independent film on Netflix unless you somehow get it to some big aggregator. Like yeah. Netflix and Redbox are almost impossible to get into unless you make a certain kind of film and you have the certain kind of push behind it. Right. Yeah. Like Redbox goal, Redbox's main goal isn't really to, you know, their main goal is like they when they buy independent films, they buy the independent films that people might confuse for the real films. You know what I mean? Oh. Uh, like <laughs> oh god. So it's like Say Transformers comes out, and then you know they have the Transformers ripoff. They put that in the red box the same time Transformers yeah. comes out, so that you know people who aren't, oh. you know, smart enough just rent that one instead, and then oh. you know their numbers go up, and then somebody's like, hey, that guy's making money. I'm gonna rip off this movie that's coming out in this amount of time, and <laughs> that's a whole so it's like that's genre. that's what filmmakers are kind of doing now. They're just they're looking for any any train they can ride. If found footage is big, they'll quick, you know, people quickly try to make a found footage movie and see if they can bank off that and get on that train. But it's just, it's all just such a mess. It is such a mess. I mean, because then you know they put those movies in Redbox and it doesn't do good, and they're like, what, what, you know, fuck you, your movie sucks. <laughs> Nobody rented it. What the hell, man? <laughs> God damn. God damn you. Why aren't people buying this? And they're just like, oh, I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's just the community. I you know, guess. or I found know. footage will be big, and then somebody will make a found footage movie, and it'll be a year later, and they'll be like, "Oh, nobody's watching found footage anymore. What else you got?" And they're like, <laughs> "No, I just spent the year making this." <laughs> like, oh well, you're fucked. See ya. <laughs> Adios. <laughs> Bye. So yeah, it's if... like that's why I just try to do something so different and out there that it stands out, because I think that's kind of what you have to do in this day and age. Yeah, you have to stand out in some way. Whether yeah. it's you know, just so crazy that people don't even know how to register it. Exactly. Exactly. And that's how this film just boomed on the internet. Like, it's just this crazy little film that just drove people nuts. And, of course, my friend Matt, if you guys don't know, uh, he's an animated reviewer. He does animation reviews. And one of, he's on Patreon, so one of his Patreon uh, followers sent him a request to do the, the review. And... It's just, I guess people want to request it because that's oh, it's a bad animation film. It's worse than Food Fight, and it's just like. Well, let me, let me comment on that real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Food Fight costs sixty-five million dollars. I know. I and know. I don't know how many animators. I can pull it up on IMDb, but I'm I'm gonna I'm willing to bet at least ten credited animators and probably fifty uncredited animators, stars Hollywood celebrities. And yeah. To- Years. Yeah. I made the movie by myself in my basement. Give me a fucking break. People. <laughs> exactly, people. It's not as And I had zero animation training at the time. It's the first thing I ever did in my entire life animate. <laughs> exactly. So, so I would like to see how many of these people can open up an animation program they've never used and come out with a feature film three years later. Exactly. Yeah. It's just like, give, give Jimmy a break, people. I mean, it's not as bad as Food mean, Fight. Not to toot my own horn or anything, but anyone who wants to do animation independently should kind of, you know, take an example from that. You know, not necessarily how it's animated. It's just how it's so crazy and weird and out there, and I just did it without really giving a shit what anybody thought later, you know? And then I somehow managed to get it out there into the universe. So it's like anyone who wants to do animation, that should kind of be your goal, is just to kind of figure out how to make the movie as much as possible on your own and get it out there into the world. There you go, people. This is your uh, inspiring tips how to be a filmmaker. <laughs> um, <laughs> but so, then again, I made the worst animated movie of all time. I, all apparently, time. apparently, <laughs> according so to some people. I, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm personal friends with Matt, and he's just like, all of a sudden one day... Oh hey guys, uh, I have a screening. You guys want to see? Uh, it's a movie that I can't watch alone. <laughs> so I just gotta do research on the film. So it was just it was me, Matt, um, a, f- a fellow of mine uh, named um, James Sullivan. He's from California, and then a guy who later comes in later doesn't who has not seen the film. Morgan, he didn't watch the film, so he, he's lucked out on it. So we're watching the film. We recorded our reactions to it, and my God, at the end, two of us got. Insane. We just went insane after watching it because we didn't know what the hell this fucking film was. 
And Matt just like sat there like, what did I just watch? <laughs> I, I, I don't, he couldn't even register what was happening. Like he didn't break out or anything, which I'm surprised like usually he breaks out when something crazy happens. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, okay, dude, good luck censoring the film. Good, good luck trying to review this goddamn piece of shit. <laughs> that, that was me at the time after watching. I was like, God damn, this thing broke me. I was like emotional. Uh-huh. So, and then later on, he uh, works on, you know, re- uh, releasing the watch, the whole Let's Watch sh- show, and then the review. And then when the review came out, holy shit, that flame war just boomed because... <laughs> You posted it on your Facebook uh-huh. with, I, with, your feed, I, with your feedback, and Mike. <laughs> I didn't, it wasn't even feedback. I made one joke. I mean, yeah, I it mean, was a joke. He, he fuck it. He tore me apart for like a half an hour. I can't say one little thing. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, your fans. Like, I, are... I never told anyone to go and fuck with them. I just every no. time anyone makes a review about my film, good or bad, I post it, and people, you know. Do what they want. Exactly. Yeah. Like you... nobody harass. I don't know why they chose him specifically. I don't think anyone harassed Mr. Enter or Diamond or any of the other people I posted. No. Why they singled him out? I'm really not even sure. I don't even know either. I'm just like, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the comments on your post. And I'm like, holy shit! What the fuck? Well, a lot of my <laughs> Facebook friends are other independent filmmakers. So I mean, you know, a lot oh, of yeah. them are similar things where. It's like, Matt's completely entitled to his opinion. I have no beef with him whatsoever. I don't think, you know, I think he's a nice kid. I have mm-hmm. no problem with him whatsoever. I mean, he seems nice and everything. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, he obviously wasn't going to like my movie. No, no, because he's... <laughs> like, there was no sh- shot. Even if it was animated Pixar quality, just the content <laughs> alone, he, w- he was not going to like my movie. Nope. So why bother? Exactly. I, like, I mean... Unless it was just to get, you know... So he can jump on that bandwagon too, which is kind of how I feel. And and that's the thing; it wasn't like that. It's not like that because it's just it's just a Patreon request. Like if you if you get like a request on Patreon, you have to do it. Like you don't say no to the person; you have to do it. So it's it, he gets paid to do it through Patreon at least. But it's just it's not like he's like feedbacking or piggybacking off that fame. Just like he does reviews. As you know, in in his spare time, so he's not like he's doing that. Oh no, I understand. Like I said, I have no problem with his review. I I watched it and laughed. My girlfriend watched it and laughed, and she's in the movie too. And uh, uh, I mean, it's a. I thought it was funny and everything. And I just I posted one little line. Like I didn't think it'd be that big of a deal. I never. Oh. I probably honestly wouldn't have seen it, except that one of his friends emailed me about ten times about it. <laughs> So how did you even find the review? Like who's... that's what I'm saying. Like this person kept emailing me. Oh saying, really? Oh. Okay. Animation critic Matt whatever is gonna uh, review your film. And I was I wrote back something like, oh great, I'm sure this will go over well. And then oh. you know a week would pass and they would send me a screenshot of their Twitter like, see Matt's going to review your film. And I'm like great. <laughs> oh thanks thanks for that. You know it went on like that for like two weeks or so and then finally they're like. Here's the link to the review, and I'm like, oh, now I have to watch it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wait. I was so wondering. I can't not watch it. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Now, I don't know, maybe it's the same guy who requested the review to Matt. Maybe he's just like, hey, I know Jimmy, I can message him or something. Maybe, I don't I mean, know. They were messaging the Where the Dead Go to Die Facebook page, which just goes to my regular Facebook. Okay. So it's not someone who knew me. No, no, not knew you, but yeah, like a fan or something, I don't know, but... I was, I was like wondering about that, mm-hmm. and then because uh, Matt has his own like little fan club per se on Facebook, and people are just starting to rip you to shreds, and I'm like an admin in that group, so I had to control, had to control the the fans in there. It was like, dude, dude, guys, guys, calm the fuck down. It's just like he's a nice guy, and, and at this point, I'm actually chatting with Jimmy to do this interview, and he's and, and as we're you know skyping, you know, chatting, I am. I'm just like, dude, he's a chill guy. Calm the fuck down. He's not like this crazy, fucked up guy who's gonna hunt you down and kill you in your sleep or anything. Jesus Christ. I don't have the time or resources for that. <laughs> so, I mean... I got he's... shit to do. <laughs> exactly. He's not, he's not gonna hunt you down in your sleep. Just <laughs> calm the fuck down. So, it's just, like, it's just a weird thing that happened that week when he released that review. It was just like... I kind of like... People... 
were messaging. Like, I didn't even realize people were commenting on his video. Like, I just, I posted the one thing and it was over for me. <laughs> I, I stopped paying attention after that. And then I checked the other folder on Facebook. Yes, the other like, folder. Oh, yes, and people this? were, and people like, just sent you messages beyond messages. And it was that's... only, it was literally only like three people. It's like I can't really complain all that much. <laughs> oh, but there's like these three people who were emailing me like, "You're cyberbullying Matt." And I'm like, huh? <laughs> I'm doing what? It's like, what? <laughs> I was already in my underwear playing video games. I wasn't cyberbullying anybody. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I was packing another bowl. I was like, what? <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> yeah, it just, it just, it, yeah. So and they're from... like, words hurt. I was like, huh? I was like, what? <laughs> what are you talking I like, about? I, I just listened to a half an hour of it. <laughs> yeah, so. It was just the situation that we both figured out on each other. I was beyond the well, scenes. It's, like but... that's, it's just, you know, everyone's kind of got their own little view of the world. There's the people who kind of view the world kind of like I do. And then there's kind of the people who view the world kind of like Matt does. And they're yeah. not necessarily going to have the same views. Nope. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, yeah. I was, and and I, I just had a discussion with the community. And I was like, hey, guys, we're not those people that bash other people just let him accept opinions like you he just made a joke about his review so what mm -hmm. and, and of course there's like a bunch of people on your side just like bashing on matt and that's what kind of broke him down like all the bashings from your fans or friends like i understand that but like i said because of people like mr enter and matt i get about 10 hate mails a day so so if he has to put up with it for two days <laughs> yeah I'm so scared. Like, because I have to deal with it every fucking day. Somebody calls me something or other. Oh, jeez. Yeah, every okay. day, there's a new comment. Like every few minutes, there's really a new comment. I'm sure if I logged in my email right now, there would be one. <laughs> there would be Probably. a negative comment on my video. Probably. Video. And yeah. it would most likely come from one of those camps. All right. So, so it's uh, like, I'm sorry if Matt got offended, but it's over for him now. Yeah, I it have is. to live with this for the next ever <laughs> yeah forever because you made the like film. all the people who were making fun of him have already moved on with their lives like they forgot that video even existed yeah it's people been are gonna hate now. me forever <laughs> exactly so yeah that little thing i just wanted to and mention his this. review is gonna be up forever my facebook thing will eventually get buried his exactly will be up forever oh oh yeah and people even his fans are like you know that video's gonna be up forever you know that's gonna be there yep you know as a memory like this shit happened gotta move on mm -hmm. so yeah, so if you guys are actually interested in watching his review or his less watch of the movie, you can check go to his channel. I'll put a link into it below if you want to. But um, so let's go to the last bit here. With uh, you just finished your new film, When Black Birds Fly. So what what is this new film about without spoiling it too much? It's kind of hard to explain without underselling it. Is, oh boy! If I tell any of the good parts, it'll spoil it. Oh god! <laughs> it's not nearly as offensive as the last movie. There's nothing whatsoever about child molestation at all. There's barely, really, even any sexual content. And when it it is, it's more surreal than it is erotic. <laughs> okay. But it's still got a lot of dark religious sacrilegious overtones so like people who are religious are still kind of going to be offended all right but it's not going to be the i mean it's still creepy and weird and disturbing but it's just not the offensive level that where they go to die is it's also not an anthology film and i don't i'm not being forced to say that this time <laughs> <laughs> it's one long coherent semi-coherent story it's more yeah. of a narrative than where they go to die as well oh good uh the basic plot is that uh, this family lives in a town called Heaven that's ruled over by this guy named Cain, who just, he puts posters of himself all over the town, just commands people to love him, shows up on TV, like, you should love me, that sort of thing. <laughs> like a really charismatic cult president leader. And uh, the, the couple gets uh, approved for a child, and they go and they get their child, and they come home and they start raising the child, and the kid's just, like, kind of weirded out because the world's, like... You know, he's kind of being born into this weird, creepy world. And, like, one of the rules of this town is that you can do pretty much whatever you want as long as you don't go on the other side of this wall where all the bad, horrible things are. And basically, that, that kid and a kid he meets in class go behind the wall. Chaos ensues. <laughs> oh, dear God. Um, so, 
So it's much more story and character based than where the dead go die. It has nothing to do plot wise. Labby's not in it anywhere. I don't really play a major part. I have like one little voice cameo on like a TV show they're watching. But uh, okay. that, I hired all actors. A lot of them from where the dead go to die, but not everybody. All right. Um, when making the film, was it a different experience than where the dead go to die, or was it the same? I can well. Like I said, Where the Dead Go to Die opened a lot of doors for me. Right. So one of the big doors that opened was I became good friends with M. Dot Strange, and then we started doing a filmmaking slash animation podcast of our own, which is on iTunes. It's called the Forever Alone Filmmaking Podcast. We don't really do it anymore, but uh, we were doing it for a couple of years, and we would just have a lot of other independent animators on, which is how I got in contact with David first because he did an episode with us. Oh, cool. So, like, just doing that podcast and having, like, M. Dot Strange, who uses the same, some of the same programs I use, but he's, like, much, much better than I am. <laughs> so I learned a lot from him. He really helped me out a lot. And just doing that podcast and talking to other animators and uh, just, you know, I kind of learned a lot more. And this was the first time I tried to make a feature on purpose. Ah, okay. So. Right. It's just, it's more like, it's not... <sighs> It's like your real first feature film. Like, it's, mm -hmm. like, something that... Because the first one wasn't really a feature film. It was, like, an anthology. It was an accident. It was, it was an yeah, accident. It was something an accidental I, movie. It's an accidental kind of thing. And this was on purpose. So it's kind of cool that you're just moving on with uh, your projects. Um, so uh, you briefly mentioned that you're going into film festivals. But what's the next step after you finish a film with... It's it's so hard now because really nobody knows the answer. Okay. It's like you can if um you can submit the film festivals, try to get attention that way. You can maybe attract a buyer, but depending on what level your movie's at, like it, you're not really gonna get a lot of money. If you've made like a low budget feature, like you may get five to ten grand if you're lucky, mm -hmm. and then you'll probably never get another dime. Uh. The way it typically works is um, a distributor will come along, they'll see your film. Uh, like, there's a number, like, film festivals aren't the only way. Like, the way I got Where the Dead Go to Die released was I was just, I had the two shorts, Tainted Milk and Liquid Memories, and mm -hmm. I was just going on every horror website I could find that had a mailing address on it, and I was just mailing them cold. I, got, I printed out, like, a little information packet, of, like, you know, who I was, the films I made, who's in them, blah, 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 and then just two DVDs with the two shorts, and... Unearthed Films ended up with one of them, and they contacted me, and I already told that story. But, you know, it's yep. just like, yep. there's no, like, real answer. So it's like, when you go to a distributor, they're going to offer you X amount of dollars and then X amount of percent back end. Okay? And okay. they're going to, it's usually for, like, a 7 to 10 year term. Where did that go to die? I sold for 7 years. I didn't get anything up front for that when I took, I had to take a royalty deal, which just means you get... You know, a certain percentage of the sales. I made a little bit of money, but not a lot. But the, the way it works is um, if they give you anything... Well, all right, I got to back up a little bit. So it's like you make a movie and you get it to a distributor. Now the distributor has to spend X amount of dollars to get the movie out. So my movie came out on DVD and Blu-ray at the same time. Blu-ray is a fortune to release. Like if you want to put out a Blu-ray, you're talking about something like four grand. Like, you really can't get it. Like, a professional wow. stamp Blu-ray, you cannot wow. get out of that cost. Because oh, other than the replication cost, you also have to pay Sony something like $1,500 to license the Blu-ray technology. Oh, wow. So it's like, you release the DVD and the Blu-ray on basically credit to the distributor. So mm -hmm. say the distributor is now in the whole, I don't know, six, seven grand to release the film. So he has to make back six or seven grand before you start getting a cut. Oh. So you got to sell X amount of copies of your movie before, you know, whatever whatever equals that amount, because you know some are wholesale, some you get more for. You know, you don't know really where it's all coming from, and you don't really get a check for at least a year if you're lucky. Hmm. So it's like they because they send them out to retailers, and then retailers have a year to sell them. And right. if retailers don't sell them, they could send them back to the distributor and get their mm -hmm. money back, which okay. I think is bullshit. <laughs> yeah, that's just so stupid. So it's like your movie gets out into every store for a year. People buy it or whatever. And then uh, whatever doesn't get sold comes back. 
that so that's sucks. like they go through it. They say, you know, they go through all the royalties. They go through the big report. They're like, did he make enough to cover his cost yet? If they did, then here you go. Here's some money, you know. <laughs> and then you know they run out of discs. Then they got to remanufacture them. I and it's like it's a, it's just a never-ending cycle. Oh god. It's like just... the biggest problem with distribution is. It's so easy for distributors to, you know, hide figures and you never really know what's selling where. And it's like everybody, like there's levels. Like you sell it to one guy who's actually taking your film and reselling it to another guy who's taking your film and reselling it to Netflix who's taking your film. It's like this big long chain of people who have to get paid before you get a dime. (laughs) Holy shit. So it's like if somebody goes on Amazon.com right now and orders my movie, I might get a dollar in a year. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god i'm lucky <laughs> oh man the only way i really get money directly is if somebody orders it directly from my site or buys it for me at a convention or something like that okay well now you guys so there's know. your lesson in distribution kids there you go kids. <laughs> basically a whole bunch of math problems that equal you're fucked <laughs> <laughs> this picture a... the biggest longest most complicated equation you can picture on a chalkboard and just equals you're fucked <laughs> there's your lesson um so do you have like a release date of when blackbirds fly when when nope. do, when... well this is the thing that i submitted to film festivals but right. now film festival politics is if your movie's not a premiere you're probably not going to get into a good film festival oh, okay so okay. it's like you got to submit to a bunch it's like applying to college you got to submit to one and then a bunch of safety schools <laughs> oh, okay and then you know Say you submit to one, the film festival's in June. They pass on your film, all right? Next one's in July. You know, you keep going down the line until you get okay. one of them. That's your premiere. Hopefully the premiere's at a good enough film festival that other film festivals will see it and just take it based on it's in that film festival because that's the way that whole nightmare works. Uh, okay, okay. So and it's be... expensive. Like, I submitted to three film festivals. One of them was $85. Oh, jeez. <laughs> a couple of them were 50 Some are 60 They're like, I'm out- you want to submit wow. to Sundance? It's something like $100. Holy crap. <laughs> and Sundance only takes about 20 films a year. Oh, yeah, it's like a few. Yeah, so it might be a while before we get to see when Blackbirds fly yep. fully. Uh... I don't really know what to do. It's like, I can submit the film festival. So I could try to find a distributor again, get a small amount of money. But then... Right. What am I going to do with five grand? Six months, I'll be fucked again. <laughs> yep. And then I'll never see another dime. Yep. Fucked in the ass. Yep. So, uh, since When Blackbirds Fly is finished, do you have any future projects in del- development now? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I actually just bought... I do motion capture with Kinects, um, Xbox Kinect cameras. Uh-huh. So I just bought the new one, and uh, the new Kinect that comes with the, the Xbox One. Uh-huh. So I'm going to experiment with some new programs, do a couple of little shorts and uh, stuff Ooh. like that before I start my next big thing. But I, I'm kind of debating between whether I want to do another feature film or if I want to try more of like a TV series kind of structure. Oh, like a series. Yeah. That'd be interesting. I I went on your website and to, to do like some common knowledge thing, and I guess there's a tab for like in production. Mm-hmm. And I've seen something called dog shit. Oh, yeah. What <laughs> dog the shit? Hell? Dog shit was that. Remember, I, I mentioned I tried to make two live action features before Where the Dead Go to Die? Okay. Dog yeah. shit was one of them. <laughs> oh, so that's no, it never what it really is. got. I shot like. We shot, I don't know, 20 pages or so. And I, uh... I just. Uh, when I was making that, I was making that in between Tainted Milk and Liquid Memories. Like, I was working on Liquid Memories and Tainted Milk or dog shit at the same time. And then I got the offer for where did I go to die? So I just said fuck you, dog shit, and I just pushed that to the side. And then you know, by the time I had time again, it was two years later. I was like, what's this movie about again? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm just, what is this thing? I'm, I'm looking at. It, I was like, what the fuck is dog shit? I actually ended up lifting a lot of plot lines from it for when blackbirds fly. Oh. So like a lot of the like, a lot of the better plot lines. Like there's <laughs> the big funny guys. Not really in it. He's on a, he's on the TV a lot, but it's just, it's, he's not okay. So, so I was talking to my friends about it. And I was like mentioning stuff on the side. I was like, he's got a, something called Dog Shit in production. I don't know if he's still working on it. There's and, a trailer for it on the on the DVD, or uh, it's on on YouTube too. Of course, yeah. You can always check out the five minute promos of it. Mm-hmm. Um, 
<laughs> Cause the way how I just like, mentioned it's like, dog shit, is, it, is Lappy in it or something? <laughs> there was pr- uh, well, no, I guess Lappy already happened at that point, but no. So it just okay. I just wanted to know about that. Um, <laughs> so, what's the hardest part of being an independent filmmaker? I mean, for me, it's just I I have to do so many things that I get overwhelmed, and like I'm always behind on the bills, so I'm always trying to juggle. How do I pay the rent? And then you know, it's like. Every month, my goal is to just pay the bills so I can animate for another month. Some months I can do it. Other months are really tricky. <laughs> okay. So it's like you got to go, kind of be crafty and you got to like, you got to find ways to just pull money out of the sky because it runs out fast. All right. Well, well, obviously the last question, which you kind of touched upon a little bit, but do you have any more advice for anybody who wants to be an independent filmmaker? Well, it's, I mean, you just got to... You just gotta, you just kind of gotta do it. You just kind of gotta either if you don't want to write a script, then you gotta get a script, and you just gotta figure out one page at a time. You know, how do I do this? How do I do this? Who do I need to hire to do this? And you know, I, I already ranted about distribution, but that's right. that's a whole, that's a big beast. That's the trickiest part right now, is because really nobody knows what to do. So it's just, you just you just gotta do what you can with the resources you have, and hope that the right people see it. That's really all you can do in this day. Yeah, it? and that's all you can do. Well, now you know all about Jimmy. <laughs> now you understand him a little bit more, right? So lay off. Lay off lay him. Lay off me, bro. <laughs> lay off him, bros. <laughs> now you understand his point of view. So that's basically the interview. Thanks for uh, coming on and chatting with me, Jimmy. That no was problem. fun. It was really fun actually getting to know you a little bit more, so... Um, actually, lastly, uh, where can everybody find you on the internet nowadays? Uh, well, I have a Facebook page, but the bastards made me change my name because they're assholes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you can find assholes. me on Facebook if you type Jimmy Klaus, spelled K-L-A-U-S, or you could just type in Screamer Claus, S-C-R-E, wait, S-C-R-E-A-N-E-R-C-L-A-U-Z. I have a Twitter. I really don't update it because every time I try to type something, my thoughts are too long. And I say, uh, fuck this Twitter shit. And I just type it on Facebook instead. Uh, I have a website, ScreamerClaws.com, YouTube, ScreamerClaws. Maybe you can just type ScreamerClaws, so I'll come up. There's only one. Yeah, there's only, there's only one ScreamerClaws, so go on his website, buy his stuff. I'm not I need money. He needs the money. Support him. Just support the fuck out of him, all right? He needs support the money. If you hate me, give me your money. Yeah, if you if you don't like him, still support him. I mean, come on, he needs the money. And I did uh, no Kickstarter or anything whatsoever for this film. I would like to point out. <laughs> I was going to mention like there are those websites where you Kickstarter. Yeah, but I, I just I don't have the self esteem enough to <laughs> think that I'm going to be able to get the right amount of money I need. I mean, you got a fan base now, so maybe it could be possible. They could support you, and you could give, give them the perks you need. And It's the internet, though. A fan base is one thing. You know, they're liking things on Facebook. But you're asking people to buy things. A whole other... <laughs> I, I, I guess, but... <laughs> nice. Potato, potato. Um, so, yeah, go follow him wherever on Facebook, Twitter. Go watch his YouTube. Check out the trailers, all that stuff. Support him whenever you can. As for me, if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can follow me at, uh, at Mike Mixtape. Uh, if you want to see more exclusive interviews such as this one, please subscribe to this channel. I am plan on trying to contact more filmmakers you know, to do interviews. And if you want me to interview somebody you know or you want me to try to interview someone you like, just tell me in the comments below and I'll try to f- hook up with the interview uh like this video if you want and uh i also have a podcast called cinema royale where we talk about films so check that out as well and uh, thanks for listening this has been the royale real rundown and uh good night That's the end of that chapter. That's the end of that chapter until you make another film. Exactly. Like I said, I can't thank you enough, man. Yeah, no problem. I enjoyed it.